Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Alison, for the introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's always a great pleasure to come to the great city of Glasgow. It's especially a pleasure when this is the first talk I've given since having a brain tumor removed in September. So I hope I'm going to get to the end of this okay. Um, and the third reason this is a great pleasure is because this is a topic that fascinates me. I hope it's also a topic that fascinates you. Um, I have placed on the first slide I'm showing you a graph of the greatest challenge that's facing us currently in drug policy, which is the record levels of drug-related deaths in all three countries of Great Britain, Scotland, England, and Wales. It's also occurring in Northern Ireland. And part of my motivation for agreeing to speak here was because of my frustration at being the author of a report that the ACMB, the Advisory Council on the Use of Drugs, wrote, which has not been implemented on how to use evidence to reduce these deaths. And I wrote an article for Journal Addictive Behaviors on why that was, and it boils down to the combination of unequal power and conservative morality. So there's a lot of literature in the field about how to get evidence into policy that focuses on techniques of translation. A lot of this work's been done by Sandra Nutley, for example, about knowledge brokerage, about creating spaces, about us doing one page instead of 50 pages, and to do tiny research that meets the deadlines of policymakers. And that's all fine, but that can happen, and still the policy doesn't get into practice because of the barriers that are in place with unequal power and conservative morality. So I'll talk a bit about how those barriers operate and then give four examples of how those have been overcome or challenged or channeled towards actually implementing some policies that were based on evidence. These are largely English stories, I'm afraid, because I'm English, I'm more familiar with the English context. I'm hoping that there's, I know there's lots of people in this room who've been involved in knowledge translation successfully in Scotland, especially around Naloxone, for example, which will be an interesting story to talk about as well. So I'm I will leave some time for discussion of these and other stories. <laughs> Drug policy is an infliction of power by some people on the bodies of other people. So therefore, inequalities in power will structure drug policy. Those inequalities will include the classic sociological inequalities of race, gender, and class. And I know DNRS, the network, has focused on quite recently on gender. Um, here I'm going to focus on class. I'm going to show you two slides which show the truth of the old song, it's the rich what get the money and the poor what buy early debts. Here we have a graph showing the distribution of benefits from the most recent budget of Philip Hammond and the way in which a tax cut that was presented as being for the benefit of low paid by lifting people out of tax actually distributes more both in monetary terms and in percentage of income to people at the top of the income distribution. People at the bottom of this income distribution can't be lifted out of tax, they're not paying income tax, most of the tax they're paying about the same rate as the richest people of their income is because they're paying indirect taxes such as VAT. And this fits with a general pattern since 2010 of fiscal redistribution upwards by the tax system and the benefit system towards the classes that are favoured by conservative politicians. At the same time, we're seeing a number of increasing inequalities in health. So we've seen increasing child mortality, especially amongst the, low, the poorest groups. We've seen a halt to the narrowing of the life expectancy gap between the poorest and the richest. And in drug policy especially, we've seen a dramatic inequality in who's dying. So this is a graph from England that looks at the poorest deciles on the left, compared to the richest deciles of neighbourhoods and the rates of drug-related deaths in those communities. And it's nine times higher in the poorest communities compared to the richest communities. So in England, this means northwest, north, northeast. In Wales, it means the south, south Wales. In Scotland, it means the deindustrialized cities. So we're talking about deindustrialization, a policy that's inflicted on a class basis on certain communities and not others which is now being accompanied by the long-term after effects of the heroin epidemic of the 1980s, which is high rates of death amongst working class people of a certain age. So class power runs through our economic system and who's getting the benefits and harms of drug policy. It's also based on morality. This is an example very relevant to Scotland. Um, 
And while analyzing the parliamentary discourse around drug-related deaths, I repeatedly came across this trope of politicians being challenged on the evidence, and instead of meeting it head on with a refutation of that evidence, taking a sidestep, like a winger, jinking his way to the trial line at Murrayfield, away from the evidence towards the morality. And this is the best example I found of it, a question that was asked in the House of Commons by the MP for Inverclyde, which uses explicitly the evidence on drug consumption rooms in eight countries. In the interest of public health, will the Prime Minister consider opening one in the United Kingdom? No, Theresa May's reply does not say, I don't believe that drug consumption rooms work. There is some evidence that she could have drawn recently that controversy about the article in the International Journal of Drug Policy suggesting that consumption rooms are less effective than has been reported. You, she could have drawn on that, some of that evidence. Instead, she takes a sidestep to a moral position. Some members of this house are very liberal, she says. I am not very liberal. So she's presenting herself as tough compared to liberal. It's a, it's a moral position, not an evidence position. And that word liberal also points us towards the contents of the moral positions that are taken that block some of the evidence use in policy. And so I'm going to give you here a graph which very ambitiously attempts to reduce all the complexity and contradictions of the moral positions that we all hold to five dimensions of morality based on Jonathan Haidt's and others um, framework of moral foundations. In this graph, you see on the horizontal axis, on the left are people, respondents, who would consider themselves to be liberal or left-wing. On the right are people who consider themselves to be more right-wing or conservative. And the vertical axis is the tendency to which they use certain moral foundations when asking questions about what is the right thing to do. And so you'll see that on the left side of this picture, So on the left, you see that people with a liberal position tend to focus when making moral judgments on avoidance of harm and being fair. And they focus less on in-group loyalty, being in respect of authority, or respecting spiritual or bodily purity. And we would, as a group of researchers and public servants, most of us empirically would probably be on this left-hand side of this graph. And so we have quite different moral positions from most of the public, and specifically the most powerful segments of the public, i.e. at the moment conservative politicians in England, bankers and media magnates. And it's not that those people don't care about harm and fairness. Indeed, those things are still the most salient moral positions, moral foundations they're drawing on. It's just that they care more than liberals do about purity, abstinence, about respect for authority, obeying the law, and about being loyal to the in-group, not, not being a non-conformist like a person who uses drugs is. So we've got to be aware about these moral foundations influencing this class-structured system of power that creates drug policy, which I've attempted to map um, using the concept drug policy constellations. And policy constellations is a word that I use to describe sets of actors who share common goals and work alongside each other towards the achievement of these goals. And this is a map of how those constellations have played out since about 2010, which puts them in relation to each other, but also on this sort of left to right spectrum of liberal conservative in drug policy. So you see, for example, over here, the Centre for Social Justice on the right-hand side, a right-wing think tank that's been very influential in England around the recovery agenda. That also has come north through Ian Duncan Smith's work in his famous visit to Glasgow. But there was a lot of movement in the early days of the coalition government between the Centre for Social Justice in ideas and people between that think tank and the Cabinet Office. 
The Cabinet Office is obviously an arm of government that's linked in to other arms of government that are concerned with social control, like the Home Office and its relationships with the police. They also have to interact with people, perhaps more like us, public, people who are concerned public health. Most of the members of the Advisory Council for Misuse of Drugs have a clinical or public health background, um, pharmacologists. Um, and on the sort of left-hand side, you have people who are more concerned with individual freedom, perhaps. Now, I would put myself somewhere in this intersection here between individual freedom and public health. One of the reasons I work, I, I get on so well with people in the Scottish Drug Forum, is I think they're probably pretty much in the same place. They a little like um, dispute that, I don't know. But what the point is that to make drug policy, these constellations circle around each other, have to work with each other and find common ground. And the most powerful segments are inhabited by the public health and the social control constellations who come together around what Virginia Berridge has called the medico-penal framework, which has informed the development of British drug policy for at least 100 years. It's overlap between concern for public health and social control that still informs how we get drug policy done. And if any of us want to influence drug policy, at the UK level at least, we're going to have to go through this medico-penal constellation, have to deal with the fact that we don't have as much power as they do, and deal with the fact that some of the members of that constellation have different values than we do. So let's look at some examples now. And some principles that I draw from those examples. Here's the rules if you have, um, of how to do it. How to overcome or channel, I think channel is probably a better word because you can't overcome power, you can just make different uses of it. How to channel that power to, of inequality and morality in order to get evidence of policy. To appeal to shared interests. Remember that both Conservatives and Liberals are concerned about harm. Compassion is not just something on the left. We can appeal to compassion across the political spectrum. We can present a threat to the in-group, because if Conservatives are concerned about in-groups, they don't want that in-group to be threatened. So if this thing harms us all, then we might be able to get some traction. We can create consequences for the powerful. Now, one way of doing that would be around political mobilization and getting people unelected. And that's been very successful in America, especially where they've had sort of ground roots, grassroots and corporate based referenda on drug policies. So it's been less influential in the UK, but noted the absence perhaps of people who use drugs themselves from the previous slide, because people who use drugs themselves are not highly visible when UK drug policy decisions are being taken. Here, in the English context at least, legal action has been more effective, and I'll show you an example soon. And perhaps I think the most powerful way is to change the narrative of who we're talking about and what we're talking about by humanizing people who are often demonized and stigmatized, by political mobilization that does that, by PR effect efforts, there's a very interesting one I'm just about to tell you about, and by creating congruence with purity and authority. And one way to do that is to medicalize the problem. So if you make this a medical problem and you shift people from the deviant group to the patient group, then it's easier to get your evidence into policy. So the first story, a very famous public relations campaign, um, which not only had the distinctive feature of reminding us of our own mortality by using this imagery of the grave to scare us all shitless of getting HIV and AIDS in the 80s. Um, it's also interesting, if you look along the bottom, gay or straight, male or female, anyone can get HIV and AIDS. And so perhaps the most famous example of the ACMD working as it should, informing ministers, ministers taking that information and turning it into policy was in the late 80s. I mean, there's people in the room who were involved in this, um, around the AIDS and drug misuse report of 1988, that stated that it was more important to prevent HIV than it was to get people off drugs, I'm paraphrasing here. And that was accepted by the Thatcher government and harm reduction initiatives were taken. It's interesting if you read the parliamentary debates around that time, how different the tone of Conservative ministers is to how it is now. So at the time, David, Me David Mellor, the erstwhile darling of the Chachso scene, um, was the health minister. And he was quoted, he said in Parliament in 1989, if there is a need demonstrated to spend money in order to deal with this problem, then it's the government's duty to do so. 
That is very, very different from what Conservative ministers have said recently about regulated debts. And obviously that was at a time of a post deregulation financial boom that meant there was more money in the coffers. But in terms of the moral, the moral position, who are we talking about? It was clear that David Mellor was talking about protecting the whole community, not just an outgroup from a particular problem. It's very clear from the discourse that the problem of drug-related death is imagined to only affect an outgroup, the train spotter generation, which have, have long been it's just another way of saying junkie. Another way of making these people different from us and therefore not responding to their needs. A second example is the successful expansion um, of drug treatment under new labour in England, which was not done on the basis of compassion for that group of stigmatised people, but on the basis that it would save the rest of us from the crime that they commit. And so at the time, the figure, the ratio was given to spend one pound on drug treatment, you save nine pounds in crime. This is a chart I've taken directly from a PowerPoint pack of 110 slides that was presented to the Prime Minister by the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit. The evidence for that wasn't very good, as I've written elsewhere. Since that ratio has been revised downwards to one, to one pound to two and a half pounds by the Drug Treatment Act, research study. but this is an argument that was made not on the basis of fairness or compassion, but of protecting an in-group. So there was an evidence-based policy, methadone maintenance, that was expanded, but not on the basis of the evidence for it, but on a rather dubious, I think, argument that the best way to reduce crime is to expand methadone maintenance. This is the story that I was most intimately involved in myself. During the 90s, I spent a lot of time trying to get methadone into prisons around Europe. England was particularly resistant. Um, there was something called Healthcare Standard 8, which meant that doctors would give people methadone a very rapidly tapering dose in some prisons. Many doctors refused even to do that, and people would be withdrawn without any medication at all. And our arguments, based on the work of Kate Dolan in Australia and others, that methadone is not only effective, there's also a human right to equivalence of treatment within prisons and outside prisons, were ignored. Until two things happened. One was the research by Michael O'Farrell and others about the deaths, the high rates of death coming out of prison. That didn't really have an impact on its own until there was this legal case that went right to the European courts. And the UK government was found to be liable for quite large fines to quite large numbers of people because they'd been denying them their human rights. And things changed. And all of a sudden, that research by Michael Farrell on the higher rate of deaths amongst people <coughs> leaving prisons got taken up and used as the reason to expand methadone through the integrated drug treatment system in England. And the effect of that was excellent. Which more recently, research from Michael Farrell and others showing that if you look at the survival curve, the top line, this, this, these are proportions along across time of people who survive, I mean live, after leaving prison. And the top line is people who've been given methadone and the bottom isn't. And you see a large, large difference in the proportion of people who are surviving in, this, in the first few weeks after leaving prison, depending on whether or not they were given methadone in prison. A successful example of evidence implementation, but not, I think, because of the power of the evidence, but because of the consequences for the powerful of not implementing the evidence. The final story is a fascinating one, which I'm running out of time to tell, um, but it's about medical cannabis. So on the face of it, there are fascinating process by which a long-standing piece of evidence that there are people out there who could benefit from medical cannabis has been responded to by the government, which has finally allowed some doctors to prescribe. But again, this was not about the evidence, there's been people making that argument for decades. And it was the dog that didn't bark in UK drug policy compared to its salience in American drug policy, for example. What's made the difference is the appearance on the scene of a think tank called Voxfast, which is very well funded by social media money, and its employment of people who used to work for the Cameron government, who've got very good connections with right-wing newspapers and can get families in front of ministers who find it impossible to justify why Sticking to the Message of Drugs Act justifies the suffering of the children that have been put together in this very neat website, Families for Access. Again, not about the evidence alone, but about the power that is given to the evidence by, in this case, a successful PR campaign.
if we do want to get evidence into policy, we cannot rely on the quality of evidence alone, nor can we rely purely on the technocratic linkage of researchers with policymakers, however short we make our summaries. We have to deal with the fact that, that power and morality get in the way, and therefore we have to think about how we're going to do these things. But, as Foucault said, power involves resistance, and when we exercise power, that also promotes resistance, and there's pushback. So we've seen harm reduction to some extent superseded in drug, drug policy narratives by the narrative of recovery, which is closer to this conservative value of purity. We've seen the provision of opiate substitution treatment threatened by budget cuts both north and south of the border. And the way that medical cannabis has been implemented in the UK is so restrictive that only very few people are, are planned to get it. So it always pushes back. And also we can we risk feeding a narrative that in the long term is damaging to the people we want to help most. So I'm going to give you a plausible example, which is very difficult to demonstrate empirically, which is the damage that I think was done by promoting the drug crime link as a reason for expanding drug treatment. But because by promoting the drug crime link as that reason, we reinforce the idea that high harm causing users, as they were known in the documents, are this group that we need to be scared of, the out group to which we need to respond with, a, with a, a social control measure, which happened to be at that time true. And if we create and reinforce a threatening outgroup, how likely is it that when that members of that group start to die in large numbers, without necessarily causing problems for people who are not related to them, that government will be compassionate and that publics will demand action to save those lives. So this is a power struggle and the struggle continues because the rates of death are still high, but it, does so in ways such as coordinated by the Scottish Drug Forum in the Stop the Deaths campaign, which I wish every success to. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, there's some information here about the references I've referred to, and I'm very happy to take questions now or by Twitter or email in the future. Thank you. Hi, Alex. I'm Wayne Gold from Aberdeenshire Alcohol Drug Partnership. I really enjoyed your assessment of the situation and um, it certainly brings true to my experience. But um, my responsibilities cover alcohol and drug policy and I was quite taken by your um, drug policy constellation, the kind of liberal, conservative, puritanical kind of ends of, of drug policy. And it's quite often the case that um, some of our um, detractors in the alcohol industry would argue that we're the Puritans, that we're the Conservatives, that we're you know, making moral judgments about you know, alcohol consumption. Do you think that's a special case or do you think there's another dimension that needs to be included in that? I think it's a universal case that people who are involved in policy arguments will try to derive the values and the evidence that's been used by the other side. So the alcohol industry is pushed back on the model of minimum unit pricing, as well as on the morality that is held by people in this, the killjoy aspects of limiting access to alcohol. I've been labelled a Puritan killjoy by people who want to create a much more free market in advertised cannabis than I would prefer to. With, that's inherent in the nature of it. When you have value dissonance, people are going to accuse each other of having the wrong position. So that Thank you. I also have a question about the, um, the policy constellation. How would you define tobacco and alcohol control in that? Because I was looking in the public health and the social control in the intersection. Could be that as well, but I wouldn't necessarily define it as medical penal sorry, constellation. So I would just would like to hear your thoughts on how you would define that. Is it unique to drug policy or could this be extended to other uh, regulation of other markets? Well, it's, as I said, a concept that I've borrowed, stolen, plagiarised from Virginia Berridge in her historical work, looking at the 1910s and 20s, at the birth of the British drug control system, which was always a compromise between doctors on the one hand and the home office on the other. And so that medical interest compared to the <coughs> interest, punishing versus treating, 
there's always that tension has always informed British drug policy. I mean, even going back to the 1868 Pharmacy Act, there was that tension as well. And one of the things I find remarkable about British drug policy is how that's changed. But the fact you've still got the most influential people who actually do the writing of policy and give options to ministers to decide on are the people who are making those compromises between those two sides. Is that? Yeah. Hi Alex, uh, Dave Little Scottish Drugs Forum, thanks for you um, putting us on that side of your uh, constellation, which is uh, much appreciated. Um, it was really a comment that reinforces the points that you were making. Um, we had a funding cut of 15 million and recently that was uh, uh, put back by the Scottish Government. Now the key arguments around that were not, as far as I understand it in terms of my analysis, around the increase in fatal overdose deaths. It was actually to do with the modelling around future costs to the wider NHS, particularly around um, unplanned hospital admissions. So it's just to reinforce that point that, uh, you know, it's the wider arguments and the wider impacts, sadly, are the ones that actually can change uh, policy. Um, but it's much harder, I think, in terms of the, the narrower, humane arguments uh, about <coughs> individuals and their suffering. Now, one of the things I'd really like to hear more about and discuss with Gillian, with Jason, and this workshop we're having, Major Matessa, about the democratisation of this. How do we get the interests of the people who are mostly directly, directly affected actually represented in these discussions? Because we're making very little progress on that in England. I hope there's more going on in Scotland, but I'm looking for doing that too. We probably have time for one more question, if that's okay. Hi, I, I've been asked to introduce myself, which I think. Um, I'm, I'm Liz Harris, I work with Mental UK. And I'm really interested in what you've been saying about how changing a narrative um, allows us to find these connections with policymakers. And this might be a question without an answer, but I'm interested in your take on it. That the more that we push narrative and powerful stories in order to get people on our side and find those connections, and the ways that those stories and policies then get communicated to the public, sometimes take on legs of their own, and I'm thinking at the moment in terms of you know, the polarisation of the political spectrum and the way that the media takes up stories and how public gets on board with stuff. Do you think that there is a way to straddle that line between coming back to the facts and pushing a powerful story to further an agenda? That's my, my question. It's, I mean, it's always the problem. I mean, I used to work for charity that worked for prisoners, and it was a terrible challenge trying to work out how much do we make these people sympathetic compared to how much do we show the actual reality because we can't pretend these are hopeless, hapless, agentless individuals who have no responsibility for themselves. But the fundraisers wanted to do that. So that how that balance of creating a narrative that respects what we know about reality such as it is compared to respecting the agency and individuality of the people we're working with, I think is a very difficult one. But that is what PR does, and that's what academics are very bad at. And that's, I think that's fascinating why bulk fast has been successful in quite a short space of time in getting change on medical cannabis, which was blocked for years, is because they had a very effective PR campaign. And we don't do that. Thank you. Thank you, this will be uh, uh, to say thank you very much to Alex for his presentation. If we have time later, we'll come back and have further discussion. Uh, but right now, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Alex. Uh,